Let's track how the partial pressure of oxygen changes as it goes from the atmosphere into the arterial blood. So in the atmosphere, we said that a partial pressure is just going to be the fractional concentration of that gas times by the total pressure. So at sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen in dry gas is going to be 160. Okay, but then we talked about how when we breathe the oxygen in, it's warmed and humidified, and the presence of that water vapor results in the, the partial pressure of oxygen being lower. So it went down to around 150. Okay, and we called that our PiO2. Okay, the next thing we talked about was that we, when you get into the alveolar space, now there's uh, CO2 in here, right? We said that there's CO2 kicking around in the alveolar space and that exerts a partial pressure which reduces the partial pressure of oxygen and it reduces it down to about a hundred, okay? And we called that our alveolar PO2, okay? Then what's going to happen? We get, gas exchange is going to take place. This is going to diffuse across the alve alveolar capillary membrane into the pulmonary capillary. And it's so this is around 100 here, and it's going to be it's going to pretty much maintain its PO2 across that membrane. It's a very very thin membrane. For the most part, under normal conditions, that diffusion is very very efficient, and most of that PO2 is going to get across. So we're going to say around 100 here, and we I guess we could label this it'd be the partial pressure of oxygen, and we could maybe say, I don't know, in the pulmonary capillary. I'm, I'm making these letters up at this point, so don't remember these things. But so we've maintained our partial pressure across the blood gas barrier. So then what's going to happen? Well, then we're going to drain into the pulmonary venous system. This is all going to sort of collect like tributaries, and they're going to end up in the left atrium. Okay, so these are going to enter the left atrium via the four pulmonary veins. Okay, this is well oxygenated blood. It's going to go through to the left ventricle out through the aorta and into the systemic arterial system, okay? But in the left atrium, it's going to be joined by blood from two other sources, and we're going to talk about those now. So the first source, well, maybe we'll just draw an arrow here, and is from anatomic shunts. Anatomic shunts. And what these are, this is blood that has essentially bypassed the gas exchange and has gone from the right side of the heart as venous blood to the left atrium without being oxygenated. And there's a couple of sources of these. One is the bronchial circulation. And we're not going to get too much into these. This is more anatomy than anything else. And the other is certain parts of the coronary circulation. Coronary circulation. Okay, so those are going to be venous, deoxygenated venous blood draining into the left atrium without undergoing gas exchange, okay? So that's going to be poorly oxygenated and it's going to dilute down our nice rich 100 PO2 that we had here, okay? The second source is any physiologic VQ mismatch. That sounds like a scary term. VQ mismatch. Okay, so we're not going to get too much into this either, this for, uh, for other videos, but essentially V is our ventilation coming into the lungs, and Q is the perfusion, and these need to be well matched in order to have effective gas exchange. If you have ventilation but no perfusion, then you don't get gas exchange, and similarly if you have perfusion but no ventilation, you don't get gas exchange. So any mismatching of these two can lead to um, can lead to poorly oxygenated blood entering the left side of the heart. And there's a certain amount of physiologic VQ mismatch, which is which is normal. Okay, so those are sort of two sources of poorly oxygenated blood entering the left atrium. So what that does is it lowers the PO2 slightly in the blood, leaving the left ventricle, going out through the aorta into the systemic arterial system. So then if we took a blood sample here, which we do all the time, called an arterial blood gas, out of an artery, we can measure what would then be the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood, the PaO2, okay? And a normal value for that is around 80 to 100. And that's going to vary in, um, in different textbooks and based on what institution you work out. But you can see that there's, it's lower than it was in the pulmonary, um, sorry, in the, in the alveolar space, okay?
So, so how is that important? Well, now we know that we have our pulmonary, uh, sorry, our alveolar partial pressure of oxygen and our arterial partial pressure of oxygen. So what we can do is take the difference between the two. So that difference we call the AA gradient. So if we said the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen minus the arterial partial pressure of oxygen, and a normal value for that is around five to 10 millimeters of mercury. And that difference is due to these factors that we talked about here, for it being diluted a little bit down by some anatomical shunts and some normal VQ mismatch, okay? So what this is called is the AA gradient. And this is used clinically quite a lot. And it's useful in helping us kind of figure out what's going on when someone presents with hypoxemia. So what we'll maybe do is we'll go through a case so let's talk about a patient who is breathing 50% oxygen, 50% O2, and they're doing that at sea level. Okay, at sea level. Okay, and then we took an arterial blood gas down here, and that gave us a PaO2 of 50 millimeters of mercury and a PCO2 of 50 as well, millimeters of mercury. So what I want you guys to do um, is figure out what their AA gradient is. So we'll use the alveolar air equation to figure out what their alveolar PO2 is and then see what this difference is, okay? So um, you may have paused the tape and, and be back looking for the answer, so we'll go through it now. So what we're gonna do, we know that our PaO2 is gonna equal our barometric pressure. So the question said they were at sea level. So that's 760 millimeters of mercury. We're gonna minus out our water pressure and then we're gonna times by our fraction of inspired oxygen, right? And that's 50% oxygen. So that's gonna be 0.5. Okay, and then we're gonna factor in our alveolar CO2 partial pressure, right? We do that by taking our um, arterial CO2, 50, and dividing it by our respiratory quotient of 0.8. And that's going to give us uh, 356.5, that would be our PiO2, right? And then we're gonna minus our alveolar CO2, which is 50 divided by 0.8, which is 62.5. Okay, so what that gives us is a PaO2, PaO2 of 294 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so that's our alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. But then we said that our arterial was 50. So if we do 294 minus 50, what do we get? That gives us 244, right? 244 millimeters of mercury. So that is our AA gradient in this patient, like that, okay? Now, there's a couple of things we need to mention. Firstly, this five to 10 AA gradient for normal is based on someone breathing room air, right? This is someone breathing 21% oxygen, okay? If some, we also have a normal value if you're breathing 100% oxygen. So we say that if you're on 100% oxygen, that AA gradient should still be less than 65 millimeters of mercury, okay? 100% oxygen, pure oxygen. But this person's breathing 50% oxygen, so not quite, not quite 100, it's probably, in between the two, and their AA gradient is 244 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so that's an enormous AA gradient. So that tells us that gas exchange is not taking place in a normal way, okay? They have, what do we say their PiO2 was, right? They had a, a PiO2 of 356, so up here, right, of 356, and their PaO2 here was 294, but only only 50 of that is making it to the arterial blood. So it brings up another thing that we can do when we have these numbers. We've, we've calculated the AA gradient, which is this, but we can also calculate the AA ratio, 
like this, which is essentially when you take your PaO2, your arterial of 50, and we divide that by our alveola, which we f figured was 294, right? So if you do that, you get 17%. So that's pretty inefficient, right? We would expect that that would normally be greater than 90%, okay? For a, an AA ratio. So we have all this alveolar partial pressure of oxygen, but it's not making its way into the alveolar, into the arterial blood. So there's some sort of problem. Either the diffusion isn't working very well, or we have excessive amounts of shunted blood that can be either VQ mismatch or pure shunt entering the left atrium without undergoing gas exchange. Okay, so con let's contrast that to someone who, let's say, was hypoxemic because they were hypoventilating or because they were breathing, um, breathing at high altitude and had a, a, d a decrease in the barometric pressure like we did in the examples video, the last one. Those people you would expect to have a normal AA gradient or a normal AA ratio because the, their lung mechanics and their lung physiology is normal. There's nothing wrong with their gas exchange process. They're just breathing uh, essentially a, a low oxygen gas mixture. Well, I shouldn't say low oxygen. The oxygen is still 21% of the gas mixture, but the overall pressure is so low that their PaO2 is very, very low. Okay, so they would have a normal AA gradient. Whereas somebody who had severe lung disease or maybe severe COPD or um, bad lung disease might have a lot of shunting and a lot of uh, inequality between ventilation and perfusion, which is adding poorly oxygenated blood to the left si left side of the heart and diluting that PO2 down when we find it in our arterial blood. So the AA gradient and the AA ratio are useful little ways of figuring out what the cause might be for someone who presents with hypoxemia.